Thanks very much. Everybody hear me at the back okay? Great. Um, that se the last session before tea was brilliant for somebody my age and probably one of only half a dozen people in the room who will remember the original recordings of Tom Lehrer. He was the guy in the, in the black and white uh, film bit who was actually a maths professor at Harvard and a brilliant satirical songwriter. And in fact, that particular one, we'll all go together when we go, was at the height of the Cold War. But it gives me a starting point for this. If any of you have not come across him, then Google Tom Lehrer. It's L-E-H-R-E-R -E -R, and it'll open up a whole world it may be nearly 50 years ago but some of the satire at that time was absolutely brilliant and he was I think one of the best it's a good starting point because I very rashly said I'd talk about world security in the digital age that's a huge area and I'm just going to have to cover it really quite briefly but the starting point in a way is just taking a very broad look at the last what 65 years or so it divides fairly neatly in security terms into two periods the sort of Cold War period from late 1940s to about 1990 and then the 20, 22, 23 years since then, since the ending of the Cold War. Um, it's always worth remembering just how incredibly dangerous that previous time was, and people tend to forget that as it's receding into history. But if you go back, say, 30 years ago, if we were having a TED talk in, say, 1982 instead of 2012, then what would be at the front of virtually everybody's thoughts would be the risk of a central nuclear exchange, as it was uh, officially called, a nuclear war. And I mean, we were dealing with an age when there were 70,000 nuclear warheads, 70,000, all of them much more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb, where, you know, a standard Soviet weapon dropped over Bradford would kill all 400,000 people in Greater Bradford more or less instantly. That was the kind of world we were in, and it's one which to some extent we've escaped from. Um, we now know, with the opening up of the archives and the fact that people talk to each other, the Soviets and the Americans talked to each other in the 1990s, that that period was incredibly dangerous, far more than even the most avid uh, CND person would argue. The Cuba Missile Crisis in 1962 came very close to all-out nuclear war, uh, a, a crisis that wasn't even reported at the time in the open literature, the able Archer incident in 1983 was when the Soviets, undergoing a leadership crisis, mistook a NATO exercise for preparation for war. There'd be many examples of nuclear accidents, including nuclear release, although never a nuclear explosion outside of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. There'd be nuclear weapons lost and never recovered at sea. All that, I think, is forgotten now, but it's still a part of our history. And we're also dealing with a period of over 40 years when there was an immense concentration on the military, where world military expenditure, 85% of it was just NATO and the Warsaw Pact. But we got out of it. Uh, in some ways, the danger of a central nuclear war was small, but it would have been utterly disastrous, a kind of over-the-abyss type thing. We are, to some extent, on a slippery slope now because of the risk of proliferation, small nuclear wars in far-off places. But that era really, to a very large extent, is gone. What do we face in the future? What are the really big issues? What are the kind of drivers of world security or world insecurity? I think they're rather different from the Cold War era, but they were there. They were just stating in a way. And I'd actually list probably three main things at the core. One of these, and it may be a bit of a surprise, is the fact the world economy as an economic system is not working and hasn't been working for very many years in the sense that it has been delivering variable, sometimes patchy economic growth. It has not been uh, uh, producing equity and social economic justice. You have a position now where about worldwide, 20% of the global population, including, I would have to say, everybody present in this room, is actually benefiting hugely over many years. There are ups and downs. We're in a down at present, but over many years from economic growth. But the four-fifths of the world is relatively marginalized. It's not that the poor are getting poorer, but the gap between the one-fifth and the four-fifths is uh, widening alarmingly. In fact, about 20% of the world's population now has between 85% and 90% of the wealth and income. And that actually is growing. As I say, the poor are not getting poorer, but the divisions are actually widening. And in a sense, I'm not talking about the 1% super rich, I'm talking about this trans-global elite, which will include maybe 100 or 120 million people in India, maybe 150 million in China. 
it will also exclude maybe 40 million people in the United States who could not afford even basic health insurance and certainly millions of people in Britain as well. It's a transglobal phenomenon. That I think is the first marker but one subset of that is very important. It links in very much with some of the things that have been said here this afternoon and that is there's been tremendous progress, really positive progress on the side of issues like education, communications and literacy. My first job over 40 years ago was working in Uganda at a time when a very small proportion of kids got even four years of primary education. That has been transformed in most countries right across the world and even slowly, very slowly, the gender gap has narrowed. Not enough, but it has to some extent. But what this means essentially with huge improvements in education, communications and the rest is that in a sense the people, the majority, who are not sharing as much in the wealth of the world are far more more aware of that. 30 years ago, pop sociologists used to talk about the revolution of rising expectations. In the consumer society, people would at least get richer and they would benefit more. Now we have a global phenomenon, the revolution of frustrated expectations. A classic example being the neo-Maoist Naxalite rebellion in India, which caused the huge problems. It's very much from the margins where people become desperate. So you have that phenomenon. Now that itself is manageable if there was the the kind of economic change which would produce a more equitable society. We see few signs of that at present, but here are the last signs. But then I said there were three things. The second one is we're in the early stages now of coming up against environmental limitations on human activity, limits to growth. It's very worthwhile going back and actually rereading that little book from 1972, Limits to Growth, because in fact that was the world's first detailed systems analysis study of the world economic system, and it was predicting major problems ahead because there were physical limits to the growth of human activity. It was actually predicting them from about 2010 through to 2040. It was not predicting them in the near future, predicting in fact in our era. And I think the biggest example of this we see obviously is climate change. That essentially that is a phenomenon which is accelerating, it's asymmetric and there are positive feedback loops built into it. You put the two together as socioeconomic divisions and environmental limitations and you have in a sense the big drivers for potential problems but but of course for them there are solutions as well. But the final factor which I wanted to mention is the tendency to try and maintain the status quo. To actually see these problems as some things which have to be managed more by and large by the more powerful elite communities of the world, whether within states or in fact across states. Um, the word I've coined for this is lidism. You keep the lid on things rather than going to the underlying problems. And you see that in many ways, in some ways, in fact the history of the last 10 or 11 years, the war on terror, is an illustration of reaching from military solution to complex problem which was far more detailed than that and required very different approaches. Now if you put those together this is the kind of issue that we're facing in the future but as I say for those problems they're very much answers. Where does digitization, where does the phenomenon that we're talking about largely this afternoon come in? This is an area which is beyond my area of expertise, so I'll just put pointers in. I'm sure there are many people here who know far more about it but I'll just suggest two or three things. Um, one very clearly is that in military terms there are new forms of maintaining control. Uh, one of the classic ones is the development and very widespread uh, deployment of drones, uh, both reconnaissance and armed drones, what are called unmanned combat aerial vehicles, UCAVs, and the very wide use of those now in countries such as Afghanistan, uh, Yemen, uh, Somalia, and of course Pakistan. That is a very recent phenomenon which has been made possible by the development of a whole range of technologies. And there are many other examples, including the whole phenomenon of electric network network centric warfare which illustrate how military can adapt to this changing world environment. On the other side of the coin though there have been huge developments in communicability in terms of revealing and developing how things are going on, reporting in other words, the capacity of different kinds of technologies to be used. Let me give one potentially graphic and in some ways uh, rather shocking example of what we might be talking about. Let us suppose 
suppose that for reasons which we will not go into, it's decided that a drone attack is staged on a Pakistani target, maybe a small cluster of houses somewhere in western Pakistan, on the assumption that there is an al-Qaeda operator actually in that house. Now, that drone may well be a reaper. It may well be actually uh, piloted, so to speak, either by a pilot in Nevada or possibly, if it was a British drone, by a pilot, so to speak, at RAF Waddington in Lincolnshire, just north of Lincoln, just south of Lincoln, which is going to be the British centre for these for these things actually going to be run from. Suppose that happens, and supposing very quickly, even cell phone footage of what happened and the people killed goes pretty viral. And supposing in response to that, somebody gets so intensely cross, if you like, utterly angry at this, that that person bombs a Burger King in Lincoln in response. You're seeing there both the idea of warfare being used in the digital age with extraordinary precision at a distance with no person engaged in that warfare actually at risk directly but also because of the way in which communicability has changed, the possibility that that can come back immediately. In other words, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that the concept of lidism itself is actually at fault. It's at, it, it just is faulty at root. Uh, the idea that you can sort of close castle gates against a world which is becoming more divided and more limited is actually false. And if 9-11 didn't show us that, then I don't know what will. What does that mean for the future? I mean, I think it means that at present we are in an era where we are recognizing these dangers and there are all kinds of possibilities to turn them around. Uh, there are all kinds of ways in which you can develop more fair economies. If you're interested in this, the first place I would go to is the New Economics Foundation and their Great Transition Project. There are all kinds of ways in which you can rethink your approaches to security, what is now being called sustainable security. Check out the Oxford Research Group on that one. If you're looking at all the different ways in which you can move to ultra-low carbon economies, cutting back by 80%, not 50%, this can be done. The real question is whether you're going to actually have the political will to do it. Because in a sense, in essence, when you're dealing with the kind of phenomena we're facing, these are problems which are not hugely with us yet. They're going to be with us over the next 20 to 30 years. But action to prevent them becoming major problems actually has to be implemented in the next 5, 10, maybe 15 years. Um, I have a definition of prophecy, which is prophecy is suggesting the possible. And in many ways, I think the era we are in now, and I think particularly from now through until 2020, is the kind of era in which people need to put forward much more positive ideas, much better ways of actually moving forward. The one thing here is the changes in communicability, the changes in distribution of information can be tremendously advantageous. Ideas can spread quicker. You can get a lot of rubbish out there as well, but good ideas can spread much quicker than they did before. And they can go global. And I take your point that you were saying about the whole cultural aspects of this, because in essence, there is always a risk that you're looking at from one narrow ethnocentric viewpoint, which is desperately dangerous to do. So I suppose in a sense, in, in a, a very brief chat here, what I'm trying to say is that we're moving into a world in which there are very major challenges and hugely good possibilities, many different possibilities for improving things. I think in some ways uh, this is going to be one of the most interesting and important decades of maybe 100 years or so. If you look at it in very broad terms, and I'll end on this point, you could say in one sense that the world's most interesting decade, may, uh, century, may well be 1945 to 2045, and in some ways the most dangerous, but the one with greatest promise. 1945, the invention of the atom bomb, that was when the human community managed to develop the means potentially to virtually destroy itself. We're almost out of that. We're not completely out of it. We've survived that. We're now in the second phase of that century where we have the ability to do untold destruction to the global environment. And we can get out of that as well. But I think this is going to be in some ways more difficult because the danger isn't quite so obvious. I'll finish on this point. We have two grandchildren. One is Zoe, who is age three, and the other is Ben, who will shortly be one year old. Both of them could quite realistically be alive in the 22nd century.
And I'd like to think that when they're in their later years, when they're probably 60 or 70 and still very active, they might look back and say, the kind of thinking and kind of changes that were brought in in the 2010s and 2020s have actually made the world a more decent and peaceful and just place. If they can say that, then I think the people who are working in this field will have achieved a lot. But I would say that if they can say it, they will be aided by the kinds of developments that have been thrown up by the digital revolution. And in that sense, at least, it could be very much a power for good. Thank you.